Okay, gang, we're back for what I think is going to be the last uh, video for this chapter in development geography. Uh, this uh, covering uh, the aspect of nature and climate. And so I want to update this uh, visual for you. Uh, your book has uh, data that says 10 hottest years on record have been since, what, 1998? Because 98 was a pretty hot year. But I'm here to tell you that... Uh, the 10 hottest years on record have been since 2009. Um, and why not, as you see here, 2005? It's because 2020 uh, tied 2016 for the hottest year on record. Just uh, I just found this on NASA, their website. And uh, there's a neat little one-minute video if you want to see it on YouTube. Uh, but the fact is uh, the continued pace of... Fossil fuel usage, deforestation, expanding uh, livestock with methane emissions, with melting permafrost, releasing CO2, that is bacteria becoming active, and, uh, and methane that is in there, uh, that Arctic sea ice going away, uh, is the ocean getting darker, uh, meaning that the water gets warmer. Because uh, if it's if it's covered with ice, of course, it's not going to heat up nearly as much. So I'm not trying to paint a bleak picture. And maybe you're tired of hearing about it, just as you're probably tired of hearing about the pandemic. But the fact is, if we keep if we don't talk about it, that doesn't mean it goes away. And so understanding the role in which we all play in continuing this cycle means we're you know we're really rapidly changing this planet in in the Anthropocene. So um, you know throughout our lives, and certainly the lives of our children and grandchildren, are going to be. Uh, fraught with challenges to deal with uh you know heat waves intensified storms uh man the number of issues uh it's just incredible and so what i like to leave you on with this is this idea is that while we can cause all the problems we can we can do, go a long way to solving those problems as well and you will be front and center in the solutions that we come up with to fix these things but again to address a problem you have to admit you have one and right now even with Cobb 2020 and and the IPCC intergovernmental panel on climate change and, and all the information that's out there it still hasn't really changed that many people's activities because they don't see the immediate impact from it but again with wildfires and drought and torrential rainfall um, you know that, for instance, uh, just just in August, my hometown of Waverly, Tennessee, uh, was flooded. There was like 17 something inches of rainfall that fell within a handful of hours uh, in McEwen, which is in Humphreys County, but uphill uh, in the Trace Creek uh, drainage area. And by the time that creek got loaded up, it killed 20 people and destroyed four to five hundred houses in my small hometown. And it's probably going to be a decade before they get it all cleaned up. And you'd say, well, that was one isolated weather event. And I'd say, well, yes, you're right. But why is it that we start that we see so many, quote unquote, isolated events, uh, hundred year floods that are happening in successive years, for instance, uh, that town has been hit by floods three times in the last 11 years. And it's far from being the exception. Uh, this is becoming the norm because this is the reality. So when we look at climate change across the globe, we certainly see that uh, water shortages, extinction rates of species, uh, unsustainable development in many places, uh, glaciers in the Tibetan highlands, the rooftop of the world are decreasing. Oh my gosh, uh, there's plenty to talk about here. And again, I don't want to be doom and gloom, but the facts are the facts, and this is the world in which we've created. Now, um, I'm not sure where I wanted to put this. It, it, it's in there. Uh, it's it's pretty neat uh, to to consider here uh, the, the cultures of the past and what have they had to deal with with the medieval warming period or the little ice age. Uh, we see uh, we've seen climate change through time and the effect it's had on human populations and of course those before humans became a species. Uh, we're only about 200,000 years old. But that said, now we are the changers. Uh, it's it's not as much the the orbital 
variances of this earth, precession, uh, or, you know, obliquity, or you can look up the Milankovitch cycles if you want to know more about those, or sunspots and solar activity, or any of the like. It's, uh, we are the active agent on earth now. So, um, and understanding that technology has helped us to to really exacerbate those problems. We always talked about technology being the thing that'll save us, you know, time and bring us luxury, but everything has a downside and we're certainly seeing that. Uh, so that said, what are some of the ways in which we can mitigate this change? Well, certainly we've seen a uh, large numbers of wind farms. Uh, heck, just in East Tennessee alone, they've raised a lot of wind, uh, uh, wind turbines over there. Of course, there's plenty of people uh, at the behest of uh, petroleum and and natural gas type you know coal companies who still have money and still pay uh, to make sure that they denigrate the likes of solar the sun doesn't always shine or wind power the wind doesn't always blow yeah I'm being you know uh, mouthy here but this is exactly these kinds of things that you hear from them and so you can look it up I did I read about it oh these things are so ugly over in East Tennessee these windmills they're no more ugly than the power lines running from TVA coal and nuclear plants and then to say oh they're so loud they're not loud go <laughs> go look at any of them online they sound like whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. they sound like wind blowing essentially and then even that's the that's the kind of conservative viewpoint even the far liberal viewpoint oh they kill so many birds well good lord i'm being honest here windows kill more birds and cats kill more birds than do windmills every year by the billions cats alone because people won't keep their cats inside or Birds just simply flying into the windows of your house. Uh, so, come on. You know, there are big problems out there with global warming, and these are mitigation solutions. So try not maybe shoot them down before we even get a chance to get started on them. Uh, remembering the infrastructure that we've already built for the electrical grid that we have needs to be changed. So that's going to take some time. But once we get into it, um, then you'll see those prices drop, and uh, then we can do something about uh some of the global warming aspects we'd see here to air, air pollution poor air quality with uh with exhaust even though a lot of uh car and factory uh, you know exhausts and, and emissions have changed over time we'd still see they're really bad in some places like china and india uh, the picture on the left is in your book the picture on the right is one i took in 2009 in um in Wuhan, China. And if you don't know, uh, in the background there where you see that bridge to nowhere, that's the other half of a huge city here. And that's crossing the Yangtze River, uh, the largest river in Asia. Um, so, yeah, this is, uh, I remember I hadn't had a, an asthma, asthma episode for years, but buddy, I had one here. And then I stayed inside for a while. It was really tough breathing while I was in China. Um, I don't know how much time I want to spend on this. Y'all can read more about it. But uh, when we start talking about multinational corporations and whatnot to look at uh, these these holistic ways in which of dealing with uh, quaternary sector and intellectual types, uh, Amazon fulfillment and Jeff Bezos. Uh, he's taking a lot of heat, of course, for all the money he makes. And every minute he probably makes more than I'll make this entire year. Uh, but that said... Uh, he's changed the landscape, the way we shop, and uh, made it possible, you know, for us to sit at home during a pandemic while a few delivery people brought us the world. Uh, but also uh, the opportunities of, uh, of you know, customer, customer service, educational aspects, and, and so forth. So these, uh, these fulfillment centers do help employees and communities alike uh, with headquarters in Luxembourg and Belgium and, of course, in Seattle. Uh, that delivery by drone is becoming a reality here, or at least a possibility. Uh, but I don't know if they are uh, if they can put these on their own trajectories without someone actually uh, having to physically fly them around. We also know that people uh, who can buy these are supposed to register them, and there's plenty of things they're not supposed to do with them, which would bring into conflict uh, all manner of things uh, with with the FAA and. Uh, uh, potential, you know, crashing or running into power lines or you name it. There, 
but this is another technology like automobiles. Uh, we, we don't even bat an eye at the thousands and thousands of deaths of people across the United States uh, every year, tens of thousands every year, because we just accept that as a part of a norm for driving a car around. So I don't know that these things should uh, you know, concern us, that they're buzzing around all overhead. Uh, but it does say something also, though, about the individuality of the services that we require and that this little thing is going to buzz it out and drop this in your backyard. Uh, I don't know, man. That's, uh, that seems almost counterintuitive that we should have that kind of service. It's like our own little personal, you know, limousine or something or, or, a you know, our own personal servant robot. I, I don't, I, it's, I'm an old guy thinking on new things. So maybe you think differently about it, but after a while, once this becomes the norm, then none of us will question it. Um, and then when we start to see how these landscapes are changed uh, or you design them to be different than they were, uh, certainly primary industrial landscapes of uh, mining or, uh, you know, industrial areas, you can turn them into something new. You might even turn them, you might spiff them up and show how they used to work as a sense of historical uh continuance i'd give you an idea that uh i went to gold reef city which is a which is a, a theme park and uh casino and whatnot in uh in johannesburg in south africa and it's a really cool place but it's built on a decommissioned gold mine and you can take a tour down into the mine i took my students when we went on a study abroad down in there and you can see all the little ants ants nest if you will all the little tunnels and and the billions of dollars of gold that are still in there that you can't get out for fear of the mine collapsing on you. But uh, it's turned into another revenue maker for them to show people like us how gold was made. And, and at the end of the tour, they give you a chance to, if you can pick up with with uh, one hand this gold bar and run off with it, it's it's slick and it's heavy as all get out and you can't move it at all. But they say if you can, if you can pick it up, you can walk out with it. So it was a pretty cool little tour. Um, we certainly see, again, the likes of Bill and Melinda Gates, uh, philanthropy, the giving pledge, uh, the money that's that's generated to help people. But then uh, one of the knocks on some of this is that, oh, they get tax breaks and they get to shape public policy through political donations. And we, we continually see this for for one way or the other, like the, the Waltons of uh, Walmart fame. Who, and and the uh, Koch brothers, who are you know very, very uh, conservative minded, as is Warren Buffett, who's very and uh, liberal minded, and there are others. So that said, that's going to do it. So I'm going to say goodbye now, and I'll see you the next time around. Talk to you.